Charter California edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. Our guest, Tom Bordenero, he is the assessor for San Luis Obispo County. He served in the California State Assembly in the 90s and has been back in San Luis Obispo since 2002-03. So I want to speak with you about real estate, about property. It's, it's so important to all of us that we have our home. It's our castle. But our castles have been under assault a bit as a result of declining property values. I'm going to back up, though, and talk about Prop 13. What did Prop 13 do as it relates to property taxes? Sure. Prop 13 uh, during the late 70s was a result of a real estate market that really was just booming right. in a major way and people saw their taxes increasing, uh, doubling sometimes, uh, just the way that assessments were done right. where they were done every four years. So in four years, if you had a 20% growth a year in your value, your property tax bill would go up by 80%. And people were being forced to move out of their homes Absolutely. as Especially a result. Senior of, citizens senior right. citizens, and, and those on fixed income were having a very difficult time. So the legislature did not act. So what happens in California? What do you do when the legislature doesn't act? Initiatives. An initiative was put right. together and passed, and it basically locks in your market value as your Prop 13 value, right. and then it is limited to no more than 2% growth per year. And so that has stabilized the property tax market. There are discussions about whether we need to reform Prop 13 for commercial properties another day. Another day. What I want to talk about, though, is what's known as Prop 8. And I'm not speaking of the marriage equality initiative. I'm talking about Prop 8 that deals with property taxes. Correct. Proposition 8 came in actually um, when Prop 13 passed in a, on June ballot. Right. Prop 8 came in on the November ballot um, because the proponents of Prop 13 said, oh, wait a minute, what happens if market values drop in California? Right. Um, people would have this, you know, this assessment that's higher than the market value of their home. So what Prop 8 said was the, the property owner um, receives the lower of the two values. It's either the what we call the Prop 13 value right. or the current market value. And what's interesting about Prop 8 is elected assessors are required to reassess in a declining market. They need Correct. to look and affirmatively move toward a reassessment in with declining values. Correct. And usually the declining real estate market, um, it comes along with declining budgets right. at the county level. So it's kind of a little bit counterintuitive. We're busier in yeah. a declining market than we are in a market increasing because we are actively right. lowering values. So in San Luis Obispo County, there has been a decline in values, although not as dramatic as some other areas of the state. But still, you've been busy. And so what has happened in in the last two or three years. We'll get to the purported recovery in a moment. But what's sure. happened? Uh, since 06, with the market peaked, we have been we have been proactively looking at at values, um, mainly homes, which is the the largest right. single property uh, here in 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 San Luis Obispo County. And we've actually lowered oh, since 06 about four and a half billion dollars uh, in assessed value countywide proactively prior to before people come either file an appeal or appeal or ask for. A review, and that's about 56,000 items that we look at every year that we don't look at when we're under a, an increasing uh, or like a Prop 13. So market. your office affirmatively sought out those properties. Absolutely. What if a homeowner? wants the assessor's office to reassess without receiving a notice that oh sure and we get those because we put it we have a, a mass appraisal system that will identify those that might need I see might need lowering but it's only for uh, homes on 10 acres or less single-family residences so if there's ag property commercial property residences on more than 10 acres which we have a lot of of course uh, you know industrial properties or multi uh, you know, multi-family dwellings, whether they be duplexes, triplexes, or even a second residence. Right. We kind of rely on people letting us know. When we come back, I want to talk about what happens in an improving market. We're Absolutely. speaking with Tom Bordenero. For our viewers on HLN, we thank you for joining us. For our other viewers, we'll be right back. So, Mr. Bordenero, it's clear that in many parts of the state, including the Central Coast, we are seeing a rebounding of the housing market. Correct. And so what happens under Prop 8 in that situation? Under the decline of value of Prop 8 scenario, we are looking at every property that was placed on this decline of value every year and right on January 1st. So we have to look at those and then when the market starts to rebound, which we're seeing, we need to raise those back up to where they would have been if we never had a decline in value. And in those cases, it's not limited to the 2%. We're required to put the market value in. So if your market value goes up 20% a year, 
you could see your tax bill go up 20% in one year until it reaches the Prop 13 number again. Not the value what it beyond what you bought it for. So it will top out at what you bought it for. Is that correct? correct? It is always a ceiling as to what you purchased it for plus the indexing. We actually have to track both. Right. So it would definitely it would be more than what you bought it for, but it would be that two percent a year or whatever that indexing was. But that's tricky. I mean, if you live in communities, for example, in the Inland Empire or in the Stockton area, let's say, I mean, we saw those communities really take a hit in terms of real estate values. And so could they have seen 20% drops oh, in their property taxes? Absolutely. Some of those people in one year? Seen, some of those people have seen even more than that, 30, 40, 50% drop over a couple years, maybe. Right. But yeah, absolutely. 20% a year is not uncommon. And then could it spike right back up? It could spike in right one back year? up. If the market comes roaring back. It all it's it's market driven. Right. Um, if it's a slow market, right. um, you know, then those taxes would creep back so up. So what are we seeing? Are values roaring back or is it more slow and so those increases back to prop thirteen levels will be a little less painful? I would say it's a little bit less painful than it could be because the market is recovering but at a relatively slower pace than what we've seen in the past. But here's what's tricky is many of these folks who did see declining home values also had to go through workouts with their lenders. Correct. And so they finally got the mortgage issue resolved and now they're saying the property tax issue hover above them. Is there any relief in that situation or the law is the law and that's where we're at? It's The law is pretty much the law. There is uh, A little bit of silver lining though, most lenders, if you have an impound account where you're making your your tax payment, they may have already adjusted for that. Um, and in in many anticipation? Cases, in anticipation. Interesting. Do you work with lenders on that front? Because that could be the easier fix. It won't be as painful because maybe it's being withdrawn every month pursuant to impound or they've already worked it out. Or is that just not right. your or, purview? Or it's not our purview. Okay. Uh, but, or they have actually kind of taken those savings and may have actually uh, stockpiled most of it, mo- much of it in an accounting mechanism so that when they may not have actually felt the drop. Right. Um, but then again, they won't feel the, the increase. But do lenders, I mean, it would seem to me that lenders know this is coming. And so can they work with, or do you know if they work with these borrowers through the workout process that, look, your property taxes are going to increase soon, so we need to get a handle on this? Well, you know, I, I don't really have the answer to that question. I just don't know. But I don't think so because most people are really, Uh, They're extremely surprised when their taxes increase, um, which is why I'm grateful that we're here on Charter to get the message out. Well, thank you for that. That that, that they could go over that 2% Mm -hmm. uh, and to start being prepared for it as the market rebounds because we're required to place the market value under the law and that we don't really have much of a choice. Are there appeal processes? Absolutely. So how does that work? Uh, we have an internal review process. They can call our office and get a review form. Mm-hmm. Uh, they'll receive notice in July as to what their value is going to be. Uh, and they'll and also uh, file a formal formal appeal with the right. county clerk recorder. Uh, those are due by September 15th. Okay. Uh, and we will take a second look at any, pro- right. at any property. Um, and we'll sometimes take a third look because right. there's just we have limited staff a lot of these assessments to do uh, and nobody's perfect so you know if anyone has any questions they they need to do that mm-hmm. they need to be proactive will you that. work with homeowners if they need some type of payment plan in light of this spike in property taxes that's up to the tax collector ah, um, that's, you know, that's a different office and i hate to say that because it sounds it's like fair. you know no. off me on you in this but, county it's, yeah. it's a divided office the assessor is about value and then the tax collector there i don't even know what the laws are fair as far enough. as collection okay he's tom bordenera right. he is the assessor for san luis obispo county i'm brad pomeritz we'll be right back on california edition In 2012, what percentage of Americans associated homeownership with the American dream? 50%, 60%, 70%, or 80%? In a 2012 study by the Woodrow Wilson Center, 80% of Americans associated owning a home with the American dream. 
Welcome back to Charter California Edition. My name is Brad Pomerantz. We are joined by Debbie Arnold. She's a member of the Board of Supervisors in San Luis Obispo County. And sadly, the county suffered a tremendous loss recently. One of San Luis's supervisors passed away suddenly. It's a board of five people. Its chairman passed away suddenly from a heart attack, we believe. His name, Paul Teixeira. He had been on the board since 2010. And what a gentle giant that man was. I, I just, I was just devastated when I heard the news. I saw the press conference you were at. How are you feeling? I can only imagine. It was it was shocking news, shocking news. And uh, Paul, the way, we're, the way we're set up on our fourth floor, Paul's my next door neighbor. Mm -hmm. And Paul was just a howdy neighbor kind of a guy. Right. And of course, you know, we've gotten to be good friends working together these last six months, but we had just uh, hosted an event, the Latino Outreach Council. Literally, literally. Literally. You left him, you walked out the door with him at 8.30 in the evening, yeah. approximately. Absolutely. He was pronounced dead before midnight. And ironically, uh, Paul was the chairman of the Latino right. Outreach Council. We were holding a panel discussion on the Affordable Health Care Act. And we were in a room surrounded by doctors and medical professionals just a couple of hours before that and parted and went home and, and I picked up right. the call, the message the next morning. And, and what everyone has said about Paul and was saying about Paul before his passing is that despite his large stature, because he was an imposing presence, he had a real calming way. There had been a lot of contention at various board meetings recently, and he was able to just create a kind of zen feeling in the room after a lot of contention. It's true, he was, and Paul, um, he had a sense of humor, right. and no matter what, when there was tension, he'd make a little joke, and everybody would have to stop and smile, and then from there, things always got better, so. Yeah. He was a family man. Absolutely. Five children. Five children and a wonderful wife, Deanna, very involved in 4-H and right. the, uh, agricultural roots in the South County. As a matter of fact, my husband remembers Paul's dad and his dad, my father-in-law, used to go to different ropings back in the day and team ropings and, and knowing that's where he first met Paul's children. They're watching right. their father's rope in the video yeah, the, the Teixeiras have been in this county for generations. Mm -hmm. As we know, some of the earliest settlers in this county were of Portuguese descent. Mm -hmm. And right. Mr. Teixeira is of Portuguese descent. So this is a man who, in his very DNA, knew this county, loved oh, this county. Loved this county, loved his community, give you the shirt off his back. Literally. Wonderful person. He was very involved in a new uh, charity that had launched a few years ago, the Children's Resource Network. I learned recently that in the back of his car was clothes he had planned on donating. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, as if he wasn't busy enough. He had been at the Economic Vitality Corporation meeting yes. before the yes. Latino Outreach mm -hmm. meeting. I mean, this is a man that, that, that lived and loved San Luis Obispo County. Absolutely. Where do you all go from here? Well, uh, it'll be, we've got a vacancy now. Right. And it's our chairman we lost. Right. And Paul was the chair of other boards as well, so right. they'll, they'll, it, it, was a, it was a huge loss. Right. It was a huge loss to the whole county. Right. But um, there's a vacancy on the board, right. and there's, there's just 18 months approximately right. left on the term, and the governor will, will be right. charged with appointing a replacement. Okay, when we come back, I want to shift gears, if I may. It's hard to shift gears, but more issues still percolating, if I may use that term. We're speaking with Debbie Arnold. For our viewers on HLN, thank you for joining us. For our other viewers, we'll be right back. Supervisor, you reside in the North County area, and we know that in that region there are a lot of issues relating to groundwater. We know of the Paso groundwater basin, which 30 years ago we thought was filled and would serve us water for centuries. But we've learned recently over the last decade that it is not an endless resource. How is North County handling this challenge? Well, it's been, it's been difficult this year. The North County's been faced with two back-to-back -back drought years. Right. And uh, the lack of rain rainfall, of course, creates problems anyway. Mm -hmm. But uh, the 
increased plantings over the last decade of irrigated vineyards. Um, I mean, that's obvious, and there's been more water usage, and it, uh, it seems to have had an effect of depleting the groundwater basin. Right. Uh, how much is still being studied, and um, I know we all get a little impatient with studies, but in this case, there's, uh, the county is doing a computer model. Uh, that should be finished at the end of the year, and it will tell us, uh, give us a bet, much better understanding of what's going on in the groundwater basin. There's topography under there we no, can't see. No, of course. But and what we do know is that both the city of Paso Robles as well as the county has been looking to other sources. There's a Nacimiento Lake, is that what it's called? That, that's, yeah. that's correct. And I know that that's been accessed, but there's some challenges relating to that. How much can it be accessed? It's expensive to treat water that comes out of that. So where do we stand on that front? Well, the infrastructure was built, and right. um, there are several entities in our county that will be realizing a new water source from the Nacimiento pipeline. Right. But it's interesting, Nacimiento Lake and San Antonio Lake uh, were, that was the vision of Monterey County, okay. and that's right. their water storage. And so San Luis Obispo County, even though the lake is in San Luis Obispo for the most part, right. it is the, a, a big source of water for Monterey County. Right. We will be realizing some of uh, that water and some of that, it's my understanding, can be utilized to help um, with the groundwater basin restoration. And I understand there's also some acreage that's available still. It, correct. And still. so is it time for San Luis to access that acreage? And those I mean, are the decisions that will be made and I, I, I... Is that a county decision? Or it, is it? It will be. It a will decision. be. Although there's some talk, water is such a complex. It issue. really is. But there's talk. So there are folks, and uh, the grape industry uh, is discussing a water district. So many right. other places uh, in California have yes. water districts. In other words, you're creating your own water governance. Well, of course. And, um, but it, the the board of supervisors will have some influence on whether or not those uh, districts form. If so, what kind of district? What where the solutions will come from to. Uh, replenishing the groundwater basin and then what kind of uh, water solutions will be in play for a source of water. In other words, if we stop just right. our groundwater pumping. I understand that a few years back the county, I believe it was, rejected use of the state water project. Is it time to relook at that issue? You know, it's, it's in some ways a little bit late, much more expensive. Really? But when the when the state water pipeline was being laid out across the state of California, right. that again that was a vision that took decades to right. really implement. And at that time in the 80s and 90s in this county, there was a, a real no growth sentiment. People came here and they it was beautiful. As right. a matter of fact, a lot of the vineyard uh, plantings came from that no growth sentiment. But right. at that time, it was thought we don't want to grow right. houses. We want to grow agriculture, but yet, so now here we are. In the city of Paso Robles, there is some significant growth, there and there are plans for city. more growth. Right. Is that city, I, I, do you represent that city on the board? No, no, but be that as it may, I mean, is it time to look at growth policies? It's my understanding that there is a growth cap, and they expect build out and going off memory right. here, no, yeah. 2025. Well, yeah, I think you're that, right. That right. their build out, would, would right. they'd reach that build out, and they understand that they've reached the resource capacity and they would stop. What about um, recycled water? That also has been lots brought up. Lots of options right. and lots of new technology and all options on the table and it's my hope that we'll discuss and debate. There's a blue ribbon steering committee that's been um, pulled together by the county board, the prior board of supervisors, right. and they have spent a year and a half um, studying solutions for the groundwater basin, Bass Robles. Right. They'll have some input. The board of supervisors, all the citizenry, I imagine. And what about a Tascadero? Because they have a sub-basin. They that have a sub-basin right. that is not, um, that is not, not considered an overdraft. Okay, so it, it's a challenging issue, one that you will be facing, and I know it's a challenging time for all of you. I send the board of supervisors my very best as we mourn the loss of Paul Teixeira the chair of your board. My name is Brad Pomerantz. We thank you so much for watching Charter California Edition. When we come back, we'll be speaking with the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California. What was the worst drought to hit the United States in modern history? The Dust Bowl of the 1930s? The Northeastern Drought of 1962 to 1966? The Devastation of 1988? Or today? 
the Dust Bowl period is still considered the most destructive drought the United States has ever faced. It's Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. With us today are two friends from the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California. Deanne Auten, she's an aquarist. I love that title. And Perry Hamilton, he's vice president of uh, Animal Husbandry. It's Perry Hampton, actually. And they have brought what we know as chambered nautilus we'll talk about these little critters in a few moments but i'm excited to tell you that currently the aquarium has a special exhibit focusing on ocean exploration charter communications is a sponsor of that exhibit let's talk perry most broadly about ocean exploration and why it's important in your mind well you know it, it's a little known fact that less than five percent of our world's oceans have really been thoroughly explored and what percent of the world is ocean about seventy percent so think so about it's, that yeah a huge percentage right. of our world i mean Deanne's shaking her head not explored we have no idea that's right yeah, you know there have actually been twelve people that have walked on the moon but only three that have ever been to the deepest parts of the ocean is james cameron one of them he from is. titanic yes. who are the other two a uh, gentleman named Jacques Picard and Don Walsh, who went there back in 1960. It is unbelievable, and there's so much that we don't know. But the good news is, is that as a result of the exhibit this summer all the way through 2014, we can learn. That's right. We can learn. So why don't we talk about the Wonders of the Deep Gallery? Why don't you tell us about that, Deanne? Um, in the gallery, there's amazing exhibits showcasing animals such as this, the chamber nautilus. And with this exhibit, um, we're actually showing you migration, how these animals can come from depths of a thousand feet to hundreds of feet um, to look for food um, so at the surface. Let's talk about this beautiful creature. I'm sad to say it's somewhat endangered, but I think it's making a comeback. Is that right? Is it, yes, is that it fair? It could be, it could be. I don't know if there's any laws that are set in place right. to where um, these animals are protected. Right. I know that um, having these beautiful shells. Right, that's the key. Pima might want to right. possess one of them. So why don't you tell us about this animal as an example of one that lives on the deep, but then somehow comes up. And so with the chamber nautilus, if you look at the shell, there's actually inside chambers filled with gas and seawater. And how this animal will regulate its buoyancy, it will actually add seawater into those chambers right. and release salt, salt water through those chambers through a tube inside the shell. Um, and that allows the animal to go up and down um, in their water column. I want to hear about the bioluminescent fish. They're known as flashlight fish. Perry, why don't you tell us about them? Because you know, when I brought my kids to the aquarium, those bioluminescent fish, it just their eyes lit up, if I can use that metaphor. Well, some scientists think that as many as 95% of all of the animals that live in the deeper parts of the ocean, in other words, the, the parts where sunlight does not penetrate, mm -hmm. and that's deeper than maybe 800 to 1,000 feet, they think that up to 95% of all the animals that live in that deep water have the ability to produce light themselves. Right. And the flashlight fish are, are an example of that. Uh, they're very similar to the... Uh, 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 what am I thinking of? The, the lightning bugs, uh, which are not found here in California, but right. anybody who's ever been to the East Coast has seen them in summer right. evenings. It's produced in much the same way with bacteria that live in a little pouch right underneath the fish's eye, and it can flash the light on and off with a little membrane, much like a, an eyelid. Do they use that light for their purposes? We think so. Uh, we think that they are able to use it perhaps to communicate with other flashlight fishes, maybe to attract uh, potential prey or mates, or or maybe to confuse, confuse potential predators too. So an animal like this, for example, is it bioluminescent in any way? Not the chambered nautilus. Right, That's but that begs the question. I mean, I see that there's a little eye here, but are they able to use that eye for any type of advanced vision? No, They're, the eye in the chambered nautilus is very, very rudimentary, and it appears that they, they are limited to the ability to sense light and darkness, and that's about it. So how are animals like this one, or other fish that may or may not have bioluminescence, able to find their prey? Deanne? Uh, they can use smell. They have very large olfactory organs. Um, smell. Smells. In the middle of water. In the middle of water. They can smell. Yes. 
And they're smelling crustaceans, you say? Crustaceans, uh, they can all eat worms as well off the bottom of the ocean oh, floor. I, I, I just... The smell comes to them. Right. Those. And then they're able to directionally figure out where that smell yes. is. Yes. And then they're very tactile, meaning they'll use those tentacles, those 90 tentacles, right. and they'll just search for that where that smell is coming from. And then if they find a shrimp? They'll just... Grab it up. Grab it up. Done. So they're related, they're a cephalopod, so they're related to an octopus or a squid. Really? Yes. And you can see by looking at them that they have those tentacles and that siphon to use for mobility. A miracle to me is that during anyone's visit to the aquarium, and if you go to the ocean exploration area, you have a live feed. We do. Of the ocean floor. <laughs> I would have loved that when I was a kid. This is really cool, and that's one of the, the benefits of modern technology. Right. We, we're, we have uh, links to the uh, Oceanus Explorer, which is a ship that's, that's owned and operated by our own National Oceanic and Atmospheric okay. Administration, as well as Bob Ballard's ve exploration vessel as well. And when the scientists put remotely operated vehicles, also known as ROVs, into the water, uh, we in the aquarium, you can stand there in the aquarium on any given day and you can look at on our ocean exploration hub and you can see the live feed from that ROV at the same time the scientists that are on the ship are seeing it. What about light? I mean, do you have a bunch of bioluminescent fish lighting well, they have up? Lights, they Just, have lights mounted simple? on the ROVs to illuminate whatever they're looking at. And so what will you see if you're looking, what's going by, what's happening down there? You don't know. That's one of the cool things about this. You may see something that no one has ever seen before. And again, as I say, you're seeing it at the same time the scientists are. You, we also have the audio <coughs> feed from the operators on the ship, and sometimes you'll hear them say, hey, I don't know what that is. Call the biologist in here and have them take a look at it. So I have to presume that given that we are exploring the depths of the ocean, we must be uncovering new species. I, I, am I wrong? Almost constantly. Constantly? Yeah. What is with, that? With 95% of the oceans unexplored, right. it's, it's, it's almost a clean slate. I understand there's also a part of the exhibit where is it you see a whale that has perished, that has died of natural causes. What happens at that point when it drops to the ocean floor? Scavengers would feed upon it. So, of course, being to the deepest part of the ocean, right. food doesn't, is, right. might not be always present. So having this huge well huge. just drift, fall to the bottom, right. um, and these animals buffet upon this, this... It's just like a life. Just like a life. But how long, do you know, does it take for this massive carcass to be devoured? I'm sure it takes years. Oh, is it um, that long? Really? It's, it's definitely years. There have been some yeah. that have been documented to take literally decades from the time the animal first hits the bottom until it's completely consumed. Because I've seen some footage where it's sped up and it looks like it's happened you know, in five minutes, but of course that's not the case. Um, more exciting programs as part of this. I understand you have some films, lectures. Or, I mean, what, what else is going on as part of the series? Well, our, our lecture series is going on uh, throughout the course of the year into uh, February. 2014. Um, right, mm -hmm. um, where you've got a, a wide range of different uh, ocean, well-known ocean explorers who are coming to talk to the mm -hmm. public, including mm -hmm. uh, uh, Don Walsh, who is one of the people I mentioned and has been to the deepest parts of the ocean, Bob Ballard, I'm sure everybody's heard of him, as well as many, many more. Tell me about your jobs. I, I mean, you grew up and you became an aquarist and you are play with animals all day. You know, like, what more could you ask for? Uh, well, with me, I always loved the ocean growing up, especially off Southern California in uh, San Pedro. Okay, perfect. And so I'd always be at the tide pools, right. visiting all the animals in the tide pools, and of course going to the beach. Um, so I'd say my passion is for the ocean, yeah. and my job is to take care of these animals, which is amazing. Perry? Uh, yeah, I grew up in, <coughs> excuse me, on the East Coast, and I, I worked at the National Aquarium in Baltimore for sure. a long time, I've been. And, and volunteered. Yeah. Actually, started out volunteering at the New England Aquarium in Boston, uh, and sort of got bitten by the bug while Clearly. I was there. Well, yeah. thank you so much for joining us again. The Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach has a special program going on dealing with deep ocean exploration. My name is Brad Pomeranz. This is California Edition.